Well, we are back again because Larry just can't get enough of this show. I mean, Larry Goldberg, you are, you know, if it wasn't for you this week, I wouldn't have had a show. <laughs> so, anyway, Larry. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a oh, minute. Oh. That means my uh, salary is going to go up. Somebody said in the comments one time, Larry, that if you start charging me, I won't be able to afford you. I don't know what they <laughs> meant by that. I have no, I, no idea what they meant by that. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, Larry uh, uh, happened to run into, I mean, not literally, but uh, became acquainted with at the recent uh, handover show uh, down in Austin. Uh, gentlemen, he is going to, I'm going to give you the pleasure of introducing him because I'm not sure whether he has a pronounceable last name or not. So Larry, would you like to introduce your guest? Yeah. And you know, I've never actually pronounced Ken's last name. <laughs> Clemzak. Clemzak. So Ken and I met um, in Austin at his request. He reached out to me when I said I was going to Austin and uh, was kind enough to actually visit me at my hotel, stop by the hotel. Um, and he brought his mother with. Uh, his mother's a huge Tesla fan. So we got on great. And um, Ken and I visited uh, and um what was so interesting for me is Ken has this really, really a great uh, uh, auto industry knowledge because he has been in the industry, as he'll explain to you in just a little bit, for a long time. And then I had the um, I had the pleasure of having Ken walk me through some of his experiences from the Austin event, and I thought, wow. This is something, this is a jewel. This guy is really a very real value um, asset to our community. And so I wanted him to come on and share his his findings and, and what he saw um, at the event, because seeing it through his eyes is kind of like we the value we get out of seeing out of Sandy Monroe's eyes, you know, somebody with in-depth uh, experience and um, in the auto industry, seeing what Tesla have done and explaining to us what they've done. So I thought it was so valuable. I asked Ken if he would do this and he was kind enough to agree. So that's the background. For Randy and Larry. Yeah. Hey, Ken, we'll give you the floor then. Would you like to introduce yourself with a, the background of uh, all the stuff you've done that uh, that that impressed Larry so much. <laughs> well, I've been in the auto industry for I don't know, my whole career, thirty five years, and I'm in, in Michigan. So I've worked with I I really work in the automotive airbag electronics divisions, and I've been at uh, Autolive and TRW and other, I mean, all the major ones, and. Um, so my background is that software for the last 25 years. And then I've also done hardware and some testing prior to that. I started right out of school as co-op student from U of M. All right. All right. And so you walked through the factory. You're a, I, we understand you are a Tesla fan. I don't know whether you're more of a Tesla fan than your mom or vice versa, but. Oh, uh, she seems to be worse. <laughs> Better? Worse? I don't know which one to say. <laughs> but you made some kind of claim about watching some of my YouTube videos. So somebody that watches a few of my YouTube videos has to be a pretty big fan. All right. It's hard to keep up with you. <laughs> so anyway, all right. So what is it? Where do we start? What's the, what's the, what's the first uh, subject here? Well, some of the things, you know, just, uh, we started by the takeaways from the Monroe Live video that just went up, what was it, just earlier this week. Right. I did a deep dive with Brian and Hans, and we just went through that whole video and just pointed out some things. And then, um, you know, the, the key takeaways from, for me from that video was just how detailed all the executives knew everything about the, the whole plant, the project. It was incredible. And then yeah, and just, the, that's yeah. not normal. Yeah, so Ken, just Not that contrast that to what you see in the auto industry. All right, normally, normally what you do is you give the executives some overview, and then they they go to their board meetings and they just talk about high level things, and then if they have a question, you know, all the engineers are on the, near their phones during those <laughs> big meetings. That hey, help me out with this. <laughs> help on. So they're not necessarily engineering oriented, much less engineers. 
That's my experience. Whereas from the top down at Tesla, we have engineer at the top. We have engineers beneath him. Right. Uh, engineering. Yeah, either that or they've been on, they've been engineers, but just haven't been it for a long, long time. And they're not really in all the details. Right. Like we did. Yeah. But uh, every single minute of that interview had a gem from those, uh, from the executives. The, the key takeaway for me is not just each individual thing, like, High, uh, the 48 volt system or you know the way that the motors work the communications it's just how tesla puts it all together and it's a holistic environment you know someone gave the example i think they were talking about the the light show that the vehicles can do <laughs> yeah if you are in vertically integrated like tesla <laughs> you can you can do that interesting interesting yeah because everything is is its own, has its own uh, element to it, its own supplier who has a different software, who has a different, yeah, okay. Right, exactly. And Ken, you know what struck me, and I'd be interested in your take on this, is that there wasn't one guy with one specialist knowledge that the other guys didn't have any insight to. Each guy was talking about his particular area and other people would chime in because they were as engaged as the specialist in his area. So that was amazing to me that, you know, it was almost like they were interchangeable, even though they were expert, experts in their own particular area. So it, it, was, it was extraordinarily, you know, to have these very senior guys with all this, you know, in-depth knowledge of their area, but the broad knowledge of the of the of the vehicle, the manufacturing processes as a whole. Right. Yeah. David was talking about some software things, and then I could hear that Drew was, came yes. on and talked about it. And then Lars was talking about stuff, and Drew yeah. came and talked. And Pete, they they all, you know, everyone and, knew it. And, <laughs> everything. And can you had an opportunity to speak to Lars right at the at the event? Right. Yeah. He. He was sitting down on the stairs and I said, are you Lars? And he, was, he looked over at the coworker that was sitting there and said, yeah, I'm getting a lot of people there that know me that I'm not I'm not used to this. Right. <laughs> so he talked to me for like five, 10 minutes. Right. Very cool. Good. So you've got some stuff to share with us, right? Right. And Ray, um, Larry, I think you're going to show a picture of a Crash test? Yeah, I'm going to show a picture of a crash because um, you're going to show us the car or a, a cyber truck that went through the crash test that I'm going to show you an example of. And, and you're going to show us the, the car that went through this crash test. So really quickly, I'll show you. Um, it's just a high level picture. I, you can see it, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I do so, see it. So this is the crash test. This is a 35 mile an hour crash test into a solid wall. Um, you want to just talk to it, uh, Ken? Yeah, uh, well, I, I think I mentioned that I was an airbag electronics. So, you know, this is kind of, I've, I've experienced a lot of crashes. I've seen seen <laughs> them, <laughs> not directly, <laughs> not firsthand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is a, uh, frontal crash, probably a 35 mile an hour crash. And the key takeaway from this picture right here is, um, yeah, for, for you see the the occupant, uh, yeah, the occupant, the driver here. Sure, the airbag is going off, but the key thing that I'm looking at is the wheel and the front of the vehicle has been crashed, but there's no there's no um, uh, entry into the occupant com the compartment. Huh. which is key because if that happens then you know you could suffer leg industry in injuries and things like that that's that's what we want to do with our crumple zone up front Let's crumple the car absorb the energy the bags will take care of the occupants inside seat belts of course two lines of defense we want both of those and well, of course the number one way is active safety so you want to avoid the collision in the first place at all cost sure 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 yeah and i thought one of the most interesting aspects to me 
uh, of the interview you were talking about with the executives the other day was showing how that crump that front crumple zone works and how you have these almost break off pieces that get larger and larger depending on the the nature of the crash that was that was pretty uh, pretty fascinating All right yes so now we want to switch to what you've got Ken so okay good you see that and my mouse i hope <laughs> yes good so yeah um there was a video that tesla put out for the april fools time frame and this was the vehicle that i took a snapshot of that video because it showed the underneath of the vehicle and i thought that was pretty interesting you know maybe we can glean some information from that um uh just a Briefly, what we're showing here is, you know, you got the bumper up front and some, you know, some uh, suspension um, and, and, uh, you know. And are we seeing the, uh, the break of that, um, r the red, the, you know, the, the red spa, how it's broken up front? Mm -hmm. And yeah. Right. Sorry, I don't know all the components and the names. <laughs> yeah. Electrical in here. Okay, yeah. So yeah, I, they must paint these for uh, these kind of events for crash yes. events. I never realized that before, but you can you can actually make it out in the next picture I'm going to show you here. Okay. So let me go switch that. Oh, um, yeah, that's probably good for there. Oops, there it is. So they had a vehicle outside after the after everyone went into. The gigafactory we came back out and these were all stationed outside so i took some pictures i took some pictures as i was walking around and being interested in vehicles i really wanted to see what these things were what i could glean from them because believe it or not when i get a new car i actually take it apart i've taken my my tesla apart <laughs> put it back together you know <laughs> I, not to the very small scale but I, you know I, I like playing around and seeing what's underneath the skin right yeah so in this case, you can see um, <clears throat> these these vehicles. If you've noticed, they don't have um, crush cans like the Model Three X and Y and S do. What I heard in the Monroe video is that they said that they put this bumper on here. Is this this aluminum extrusion? Uh, and um, so that takes some of the energy at the beginning. So that's the key right there. Also, if you've noticed, these um, it's the casting is slowly tapered. So that will probably help with a progressive energy absorption of this crash. And the, the amazing part on this video, video or this picture is that everything beyond this point of this casting, it's pretty much intact. Right. <laughs> so so the actual event only went maybe two, two and a half, three feet, maybe, whatever the length is from the bumper to the back of the frunk, right? And so some of the things I see in this picture, uh, you see that red underneath there, that's that um, member that we saw from underneath. That's that painted member. Yeah. Right. This is not the same uh, vehicle on that crash, but right. it's representative. Mm -hmm. So this is exactly, uh, you know, what what uh, Randy Randy was talking about that this crumple zone or this the the casting that has the progressive um, uh, uh, weight has been crumpled is destroyed, and it's stopped at the point at which the casting goes up vertically. And the amazing thing for me is that all the equipment beyond that point. Is like pristine. It, it looks like it's had no impact at all. And and in order for me to understand that, who doesn't know anything about crash tests or anything else, how can would that compare to uh, uh, to another electric or to a uh, to an ice vehicle? Well, I I don't know if I can give a direct comparison, but I can at least say some things that. For a, a nice vehicle, you would have um, the engine, and that would probably push into the occupant compartment, or actually, it's submarines underneath it. Um, but there's no crumple zone really on a ice vehicle. Not much. There is some. Uh -huh. well, other EVs, I'm sure this is comparable to an S and X, but 
remember the S and X's and threes and Y's, they have a lot of components out farther of this. So a lot more things would probably be compromised. Right here, this is the box that has the radiators and that's been pushed up into this. Yeah, so the radiator is clearly damaged mm -hmm. and there's some damage to the housing of the HEPA filter that I can see above the radiator. Yeah. But beyond that, you know, it looks like a pristine set of pipes and it seems, uh, you know, like nothing is even disturbed. Yeah. This compressor has been, oh, I see what happened. The compressor um, was removed. Broken away. Broken away from that. And it's just laying down. I see. Yeah. And that's about it, right? Yep. Everything else is fine. Yep. I see that. Yeah, it's amazing. So, and, and Randy, this would not be representative of an ICE vehicle because the engine in the ICE vehicle would definitely be pushed into the car. Um, even if it had a crumple zone, there would be that. And then the drive, you know, the um, drive shaft, steering drive car. shaft would, you know, they have to actually engineer that drive shaft so that it doesn't go into the passenger um, uh, cabinet th that it's that it's also destroyed, but that doesn't apply here because there is no drive. Right. drive shaft, right. Exactly. As, as you know. Or steering column for that matter. Right. Yeah, yeah. steering yeah. column. Yeah. I mean, right. that's what we meant all along. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. We're all getting confused. <laughs> it's a lot to take in. <laughs> but some of the things now, so that's that's what I saw from here. And then um also the wheels, they get they usually break away because hmm. you don't want them to go into the occupant hmm. compartment either. So they're designed actually to break away and pop off or whatever. Yep. So you can even see that they're kind of tilted. So Larry, would you like me to start going through some of the components? Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love you to do that. I just want to make one comment. You know, I did a piece with Randy about the Mach E, the difference between the Mach E and the, you know, when when um when they did the breakdown of the Mach E versus the breakdown of the, I think it was the model, uh the model oh. Y. And the Mach-E had all these pipes, hundreds of these pipes all over the place. What we're looking at here is even neater, I think, than the Model Y. There are exactly two pipes in the entire uh, in, in in the entire front compartment, which to me is remarkable. And there's so few, there's so little cabling. You yeah. know, you look at some of these other manufacturers, and you just see a nest of wires and cables. Uh, electrical wires and you know uh, tubes and it's incredible just how neat this is but why don't you take us through it ken right. they've done a great job of repackaging all the components on this i mean you can see how clean it is yeah uh, if you'd ever take the frunk out of a three uh three y srx you'll see components you know more components deeper in here but they put everything again as far on the firewall as possible mm -hmm. so that's pretty interesting so yeah, a couple of things. So Randy and Larry, you both did a video about the 48 volt architecture. Yeah. So this that kind of was what the driving force was to get all these pictures together and, and show them. Because, um, well, this little device right here, it's a 48 volt battery. <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it may be 48, might be 45. I noticed on the... Uh, on the fender and this right here, it says battery BT45. So it could be 45 volt. Yeah. And thereabouts. Can you zoom back into the battery, Ken? Yeah, sure. I wanted to point out one thing. That little uh, red plug below the battery, that's it's been unplugged from the battery. That is the connector to the battery. And unlike the batteries of old and the batteries in new ICE cars and some of the new EVs, they don't have, you know, spanners, uh, they don't have devices you have to unscrew with a spanner and then make sure that you get the red to the red, to the live connect, to the positive connection or ne and the black to the negative. Yeah, you just plug that thing in. No tool necessary. And right. it can't go in the wrong way. Yeah, right. There's a, probably a clip here to uh, unlatch it. Yeah. 
And, it, and what's interesting at, is that you can see that the the red and the black are the you know the live and the earth, and then the, you see the two little wires in the middle of that plug. That's data. Those are data lines. Oh, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you have both data and, and power. right, probably like temperature sensors or BMS. Talking about BMS because this actually has probably BMS incorporated in it. There's a couple lithium ion cells in here. In fact, you know, the the whole parts catalog just was released yesterday, that being uh, what is it, uh, Wednesday. So, you know, I poked in there and I saw, yep, it says 48 volts on this mm. and it has a lithium ion battery. Right. Yeah. But before, when I got these pictures, right, we didn't know that data at that point in time. Mm. Yep. Um, so just key, some things to point out because I like taking apart cars and a lot of people like to see what what's involved in them. Uh, so very simple, this year, windshield washer fluid reservoir. Okay. And of course the windshield wiper motor over here, but look how the windshield wiper motor has been secured to this casting. That's very secure, right? It's not gonna move away. But um, here's the here's the motor which um, uh, pumps the fluid and then you can see the line going across the car and here it comes over here, right up to there. And it'll fill a tube is what I understand and then, you know, put some fluid on the windows. Is this the, have there been other windshield wipers that have dispensed the fluid from the wiper as opposed to spraying it from uh, from the hood? Right, I, apparently it's a new method. Like they fill a tube. Uh, when you request uh, the windshield wipers to uh, windshield washer fluid out, I, I heard that you press the button and then it fills a tube in that wiper. And then there's a bunch of holes in there. So then it um, spreads it on the windshield as it goes up. Something like that. I, I don't know. I haven't really seen it happen, but. The X, does something, the X does something similar, I believe. Okay. Right. Um, now, a la Monroe, <laughs> I've learned a lot by watching all their videos. So I'm going to give you some of the things I've learned from them from other vehicle teardowns. So you see this big luminal extrusion over here. This is a cross car member, which will provide some rigidity between the two um, halves of the vehicle, you know, this, the right and the left half. And in typical Tesla fashion, they multi-purpose things, right? <laughs> so it provides cross car, but it also provides an area for the battery to be attached. It provides area for the, um, and look at this, super manifold V2, mm. right? So that was something I was interested in seeing. So this is all the HVAC componentry here, some chillers, some coolers, things like that. And um, the super manifold from the parts catalog, I can see that it's, I'm sorry, the octavalve is on the back of this super uh, this super manifold here. Mm. So we can't see that, the air, um, you know, the, the fan. And here's the HEPA filter that everyone was talking about. Right. So it does have a HEPA filter. And then the compressor, as we see over here, has been dislodged from this member. So it was hanging from there, probably on some isolation, because it vibrates quite a bit, and you don't want to transmit that to the occupants to the vehicle inside. So those were some of the key takeaways I saw in here. Let me see what else. Um, yeah, and like I said, this is the radiator and the air intake. That's how that comes in. And that's been uh, pressed in, right, by the... By the right. Impact. Oh, that reminds me. So something that Lar Lars took me over to this vehicle and we were talking about it, and there's a uh, formal crash. He said that these two members, this is the stainless steel with a stain, with a steel casting on the back. I'm sorry, steel stamping on the back. Right. And it's been adhesively attached to this. You can see some pictures of that. I have some other pictures later. But these two fenders, even though we were led to believe that this was going to be all exoskeleton, this is like a hybrid exoskeleton right. with some, you know, construction in the side. He said that these two members take took up about 17% of the energy of the frontal crash. Hmm. So they do provide some crash benefits. I see. Yeah. 
So that was the that was the takeaway there. So so uh, because your expertise recently has been in the airbag area, there's been all this conversation about the, the front of the vehicle uh, in terms of passengers. Um, do you have any comments or thoughts about whether this is any better or worse than a Ford F-150 or a Ram, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, passengers? I wouldn't sorry. want to be hit by either, right. any of them. <laughs> yeah, don't hit any of them, yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, I think Haggerty put it pretty well. He stood in front of them and he's like, yeah, they're all, <laughs> you don't want to be hit. So what they do in Europe is um, the front, the, the hood, what they do is they normally, if they detect a pa uh, pedestrian, Mm -hmm. And they do that by some sensors sometimes in the bumper or, you know, they have different methods or even actively, right, with some the cameras. You would pop the back of the hood so it would spring up so that when the occupant, if it if it was uh, struck and their head went down on the on the hood, it would have some give. Oh, so I that's, see. that's how some pedestrian safety is, occurs. I see. Um, and, and I think Elon gave the edict to his engineers, go and fix this right now. I see. I see. Okay. <laughs> oh, something else I can show you is that the passenger side airbag, it is situated very far up in the um, dashboard. Mm. So it's way back. And then what they do is they pop out of their housing. They impinge on the glass. You can even see how you... Uh, it's shattered right there and then they um inflate towards the occupant and that's that's how they are designed that's how large passenger uh, passenger airbags work i see and it shatters the glass and that dissipates energy as well is that correct um i think in this case just because there was so much force it probably on a on a minor crash it probably would not crash yeah. the glass yeah. but yeah. Um, you know We'll, have, we'll we'll see when it happens, but I don't think so. Just all the all the forces going on at the same time, incredible. But I have to say that I'm amazed at just how pristine these components are on the on the firewall or on that member, right? And below, uh, you know, this is not a foot or so behind the crash, uh, and and. And there's almost no force impact on, on those components. Right. It's amazing. It's going to be a very safe vehicle. Yeah. Okay, let's see what's next. Okay, so I zoomed in on that, and I was able to see that, um, see the battery, and it's, it definitely oh. says low voltage battery on it. <laughs> in, a, in a 45. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> this is the best picture I could get of that. We're sleuthing a lot. So here's a picture of the front of the vehicle just to show you where those components were laid out at. So oh. we have the bumper you now just with a plastic um, cover over it. So whatever this distance is from the front of the bumper back to here, it's got to be two and a half, maybe three feet. That's about it. I'll show you some of the components while we have this picture up. So, you know, the reservoir for the windshield wiper fluid, there's a button, I believe this right here is where you can open up the frunk from outside. And then I was asking Lars, are those the headlights on the, on the, um, on the frunk or are those DRLs? And it said, yes, those are the DRLs. So that's daytime running lamps. Mm. Whereas, the high beams and the low beams are right here. And uh, turn signals, of course, recovery hooks. And here's where the air intake is down here. And you can see the camera, the frontal oh. camera. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Uh, so in that crash, this was probably demolished, right? And they just didn't bring the, bring the pieces with them. Right. Just leave it behind. There's also a button in here to open up the frunk <laughs> if you go inside it. If you if you take a nap inside and close the uh... yeah, no one will know you're there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. Let's see what else. What's next on the list? Okay. So when we walked in the factory, the first thing to greet us was this. Um, well, other than the engineers, right? 
they were very willing to tell you any information that you wanted. My gosh, my head was just overflowing with data that they were giving me. It's like, I can't absorb it all. But yeah, we, we could go right up to this windshield. Uh, some of the things that, you know, people might be able to pause and read that uh, later, but let me go to the next picture here. Because I saw some interesting things on that. I saw these wires here and I thought, what's that for? Well, the windshield wiper sits right here in its parked position. So these are probably power for the for a heated area. So in ice conditions, the windshield wiper would be able to move right, if, if it's icy. So these are these are heater elements here. Huh. Yep. Let's see. I think I took a, another picture of the, there we go. So now the camera for the interior camera is right here. You can make that out. Also the mirror on here, I believe they're removable. I've heard that. Mm -hmm. Some vehicles don't even have them on it. Now, let me just go back to this picture again. I forgot. And these are probably locating pins to help the robots put them on the vehicle just fine. This is where the windshield wiper motor would be because you saw that it's not it's not completely symmetric. It's asymmetric there. Okay. As we went down, I took a picture of this. This is the beast motor. This, so this is a dual um, dual rotor stator. And this is an induction motor for the rear. So a couple of features if people want to know about that, they're they're mounting holes, mounting positions for the motor. And we'll zoom in a little bit. And this box up back here, as well as this box back here are inverters. You can see the plugs. This is where the high voltage would go in for the motors. The motors themselves, the, the rotor and stator are in this area here. And notice how this is nice and symmetric. So there's one uh, rotor stator on one side and one rotor stator on the other. This is a gearbox and this is the gearbox for the other side. Mm. And then there would be half shafts coming off of here, which go to the wheels to provide the torque to the wheels. These are just chillers. So they cool down the motor with, um, you know, probably like a glycol to oil cooler. And you can also make out a couple other connectors uh, back here, which would probably be cooling for the inverter. Okay. Then we walked down a little further and I saw this. Are there inverters for each of the motors so that the DC is supplied to each motor and then inverted at the motor? Exactly, yep. Yeah, there's one yeah. inverter here, there's the three connections, and there's the other three connections. And is it true that it's an 800 volt supply to the motors or is it 400 and 400? No, it would be 800 and 800. 800 and 800. The only time the vehicle would be in the 400 volt mode would be if you're supercharging at a- At 400 volts. 400 yeah. Volt. yeah, gotcha. so do the split pack. Yeah. Okay, good questions. So we went down the line a little bit further. I, I took a bunch of pictures, so I try and put them together in a logical order. But you can see here, this is the air, um, the air, tank, what do we call it? They call it the air reservoir in the database. Um, on this picture, you can also see this plastic right here with the honeycombs and this circular thing. That's where the tonneau cover is stored. So it rolls up and comes down here. And this is probably the electronics to control them. Um, also in this picture, we have these orange wires, or orange, orange coated wires. Anything, whenever you see 800, um, sorry, whenever you see orange on here, that means high voltage. These would be 800 volt or 400 volt leads. And that leads back here and we'll see another picture where, where those go. But in addition, you see um, tubes coming down here and up around and here and here. And that's from the air reservoir and they would control the hydraulics, the, the, sorry, the, the suspension, suspension. There's 
I think this is this might be a hydraulic line for the brake. I'm not sure. Uh, some suspension components. And this key part right here, um, this provides, this is a knuckle which provides steering, the rear steering mechanism, because these are the, this is the rear of the vehicle. These are the rear um, brakes. So those are, <laughs> those are really neat to see. You can also see more of the um, tubes that lead from the compressor tank, uh, the air tank, and those would go to the front of the vehicle. I'm pretty sure what those are. I'm just speculating because I don't, I don't know all the details. And in addition to the high voltage lines, we also see the low voltage lines um, and, and the data lines. And uh, what's interesting about those is that they're significantly smaller in diameter than a conventional X or, um, or, or Y or S because of the 48 volt. Right, right. Further down the line, I got a picture of the rear of the vehicle so you could see the tonneau cover in the stowed position. So normally it would be up on top of the, uh, the back of the bed, but this is stowed away and it just is below that rear window that appears there. In this position, you also see probably a single rear motor in this case. So this is the, let's see, the rear would be the permanent magnet motor. The front is an induction motor in the dual vehicles. Anything else we can glean from here? Um, yeah, I think uh, the size of the casting, I mean, it, it, to give people an oh, idea yeah. of how massive this rear casting is. So, you know, it, it just goes on and on forever. So just if you could just trace it for us. Yeah, right here, this, this device, right here, this component right here. And these are separate. These are been. These are called sails, which provide more support and attachment points for the side and rigidity, of course. But yeah, a person could actually walk into the back here and do put some components, or Optimus could come and put some components in there and so, attach things. So pending, you know, pending the new process where they're going to be putting you know pieces of the car together. The car is still made in a single body. It, it's not the unboxed process yet. But even though it's not unboxed, the point is that people can walk in both the front and the back, the way the castings are made, they can walk in and do the attachments without having to get under or over or reach in uh, to the vehicle. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And in here, you can see the NAX connector right there a little bit. A little bit. You can see that. All right, so next picture. So coming back to this, we can see the compressor. Let's see, there is a reason why I came back there. Oh yeah, because <laughs> right on the line, there is an engineer standing there, it's a Tesla engineer. And I'll zoom in this to this picture so people can see this um, poster here. That reservoir is 17.4 liters. And I think that's much bigger than any other reservoir I've seen. For instance, we have the, the new refreshed S and X, and their reservoir is incorporated in that cross beam member in the front. And it's it's gotta be much smaller than this. Yeah, maybe five, maybe even less than five, actually. If you look at the size of it, it's tiny, yeah. Right, looking along on the picture a little bit more. Well, you know, see this box right here, it says filling equipment for air suspension. And what I believe they do is I believe they pre-charge that reservoir with nitrogen. At least they did that with the SNX in Fremont. So they might carry it over this, but at least it's pre-charged. All right. Now take a look at the front. This was uh, the, the, the skeleton of the vehicle, I guess you would say. This was in the entryway of the Gigafactory. And if you... Um, you can see the castings here. Let's zoom in. You can see how they get progressively thicker as it goes back. So that's that progression that we were talking about. Um, also up here are, are those places where that uh, wiper motor was mounted. And they, they showed some interesting things about how Lars was pointing out how they put uh, tapped um, threaded 
fasteners in there. Just save a step, you know, make things more efficient. It's amazing what they did. Look at these holes here. So there's a couple holes that lead from the, this is called the firewall, this piece of stamped metal here. And in a ice can, ice vehicle, of course it's firewall because there's fire on the one side, but in an ice, in a EV, it's not the case, but there's holes here. And that's what um, I took notice of, especially with one of the components that Dave was pointing out to us, uh, Dave, or, or sorry, Pete, Pete Bannon. So let's look at that. Oh, also this right here is probably where the brake booster is connected. And 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 that and that firewall is the wall against which all those components that we were looking at in the crash vehicle are mounted. Well, no, they're not. They're mounted on that cross beam oh. member. Which oh, right, 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 right. This right. shock tower right. to that shock tower. Gotcha. Right? So gotcha. they're separate from it, so you don't get any of that vibration. Yeah. And of course, yeah, they're front up here. They're front cover, front lid. Okay, so um, Pete was showing this picture. I snapped this shot from the Monroe Live thing. And there's very interesting things here. So this is the left controller is what they, they call this one. In this PC board, there's all surface mount. These are uh, connector pins. And these connector pins are just press fit into these holes, these through hole holes. They don't have to be soldered or anything. But a couple of interesting things that he mentioned is that one side of this board is the wet side, meaning on the firewall side, because that's exposed to the elements. So I think that might be the, the back side of this board. And the other side is exposed to the passenger or occupant um, compartment, which is the dry side. So on the dry side, they don't have to put grommets in the connector that connects to this. On the wet side, they have to put grommets. So they just remove a part. Those parts, you know, they may cost only five, 10 cents a piece, but I multiply that by you know, a million and you got a lot of money. And also this connect, the connector is integrated into the housing. So there'd be two housings that come on either side of this board with connectors connector mating, mating connector parts built in, right? These pins would just go through it and then you'd come and snap the wiring harness into it. Another genius thing. So some of the things that are on the wet side or the firewall side are fed directly into the other side through this board. <laughs> it's just amazing. This is the ethernet connector, the ethernet loop. I believe he also said that this is another ethernet loop connection, right? And this board provides, I think, aud the audio amplifiers for the um, entertainment system, as well as some kind of tank circuit, which will allow the vehicle to be jump-started by a 12 volt or 48 volt battery, because it automatically determines what it is and then just uh, accounts mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. So in case your 48 volt battery does um, stop working, you have a method to move the vehicle, you know, power up the electronics in it. Okay. Here we see a vehicle in some state of assembly. We can see all the components again that we saw on that the crash vehicle. But um, let's see if there's another picture. Oh, yeah, in this bed, in this one, the battery has probably been installed. And here's the high voltage again in orange. So that's the 800 volt connector to the battery. And it would plug in, you know, probably underneath here or something. In this case, yeah, see, you see the, you can see the front seats. The front seats are attached to the battery. So in this position, the battery is in with the seats for sure. Okay. Now, this was an interesting picture here. Uh, again, we see the high voltage connections back here. This goes to the NAX port, but there's also, zoom in over there, the orange continues over here. Well, these are where, over here is where um, the AC outlets are in the vehicle's bed. So that provides your AC components. Other things that you can tell in here, they were mentioning about uh, powder coating. 
this is called the door ring right here, this, this element, this stamp still element, and which contains the door openings. But you see it's power coded. And it's only power coded where you need it. Remember, we got rid of the, the paint facility in this uh, vehicle. So even above it, you can see that it just stops shy of where some trim pieces will come in. And that powder coating is the finish on the car. When you open the door, that's what that's what that's what's behind the door. Right. This is all you'll see. So this is kind of like I forgot the A surfaces are normally your you know the exposed surfaces. They mm, who, who was it? Was it Drew that said that these are like B plus surfaces? Or I forgot he used a different term for it. So not A class A surfaces, which you always see, but these are behind the door normally. But I was always wondering how these stainless steel panels are attached. You know, we, we, we don't know. But if you notice, there's a whole bunch of holes in this front fender, right? And in this case, the trim piece that goes above the doors is not installed either. But yet there's little clips right here. So I was wondering, what's that? Well, let's look at that. Let's see. Oh, let me, oh yeah. So now the trim piece is installed. <laughs> that clipped on. And they're clipped on. It's just been attached. This is pushed in and attached. And you can even see the seam here. Here, here are the rear um, stainless steel components are put on. And there's just a seam. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have a good picture of the front, but you. I've always wondered, what is that? Why is the front trim just dead end into the front fender? And you know, if, if anyone, if you see some pictures online, you'll see that it just dead ends right there. And it's just because that's the way they finished it up. That's the way they decided to do it. Oh, another thing is other things you can see in this. Um, these are the attachments for the door, of course, the camera, the B pillar camera. You can see the squircle inside. Also, so the, the rear seats are installed, the battery, the carpeting. Now the carpeting is folded over, but the carpeting is installed on top of the battery. And then the seats are installed on top of that and also the center console. So that's brought up and lifted up into place into the uh, cabin. And then this is some trim pieces for the inside. All right, so here you see that trim piece again that we we're just talking about that goes over the doors. It's stainless steel on the outside. There's a stamp steel um, component on the back and it's adhesively attached. And that's how, in, in this particular case, since there's a lot of force in the frontal crash, you can see it actually split it, it split it open. So this part must be just underneath this uh, piece of stainless steel and this one just sits on top. That's pretty interesting. And I showed you those holes in the fender before. Well. Look, here's how this trim piece has been attached. It must go through this, through those holes that I showed you in the wheel on the, on the fender assembly and directly into probably the casting, I would think. There's also a washer here because you don't want that galvanic connection between stainless steel or steel and aluminum. So I bet there's some kind of um, they, they took care of that by, uh, in some method. I see electronics here. This turned out, I, I looked that up. That's the uh, Bluetooth low energy sensor. And also there's a connector right here. That's for that camera that goes in the fender. So now plastic pieces will snap right over the top of this to finish it off and make it nice and clean. You can see the markings on the side for uh, the fiduciaries to, for the crash test. And it's amazing that, you know, it goes through this enormous crash and the sides of the, sides of the car look like they're fine. Mm -hmm. A little bit of, uh, yeah, there is a little bit of bend there, right? A little bit of bend, probably, yeah. you know, well, you see it put, it's been pushed yes, back. Yes, the result of that, yeah. Yes. But in a less severe crash, what can probably happen, I'm guessing, is that 
you just remove this plastic trim, you unscrew this, you slap a new <laughs> uh, stainless steel with the, you know, the, the stamp steel on the back, just push it in place. And if it's not a major crash, right? So it's be very inexpensive to replace this. Very less labor intense. And of course you don't have to paint it to match right. the finish. It may be less expensive to repair than an ordinary car. I'm no so. paint. And it, it's a completely independent panel. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's see what my next picture is. Oh, yes. Okay. So now this whole thing we were talking about drive by wire. So this is the front, um, the front cradle. And so to steer the vehicle, there is a rack that goes along here. It's connected on this side and on the other side. I don't have a good picture of that. Those are connected to the wheels, which you know are, allow this type of motion to steer the vehicle. But here's one motor, here's another motor. These are the two redundant motors that are used to steer the vehicle. So the racks below, the pinions are in here, and the motors drive those pinions and then steer it. Um, a couple things that they brought out in the Monroe video is that they put different sensors on each side. So one might be a position sensor on this side, and the other side might be a velocity sensor or you know some other type of sensor that's to tell what position this is in. And so they're, they've been, they are not co-located. So if something happens to one, you can still have some redundancy and provide it. Now they spoke about having three sensors mm -hmm. and coming to a majority uh, vote in each case of two versus one. That might be on the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. Oh, on the wheel itself. The wheel yeah. itself, right. I see. Yeah, because that... And that's something else that they were saying. Um, the steering wheel moves, the, the amount from lock to lock is less than one. Right. So this is ideal for, for what they call the squircle, <laughs> you know, the yoke. Uh, since your buttons are on either side, your hands don't really move far from those buttons. So on this, it's much better to have the a yoke steering wheel on this vehicle as opposed to maybe an SRX where you, right. you have to do hand over hand and you don't know where things are going. So right. this is just perfect for this application. A couple other things we see on here, we see the air suspension here. Uh, oh, this is, uh, these are connections to, to let air in and let air out of the suspension. And this, this occurs on the 10 millisecond level is what um, one of the one of the executives was saying. So that's about the right speed to adjust this based on the um, reaction of the pneumatics. Let's just point a couple other things out here. So this is the front motor with some motor mounts again. Um, there is an oil filter here to clean up whatever oil might be in there, you know, if there's any particulates during the assembly fashion, um, assembly process. And some chillers to cool it down. And then this is the half shaft, which will go to the wheels on one side, and then there's another one over on the other side. You also see the connectors for the, um, for the motors for the power steering here. So they probably have some redundancy maybe on the power connectors too, maybe to... Yep to power, to ground. It's a you know, typical thing to do. Let's see, anything else? That's good. And there's some isolate. It looks like some insulation for noise reduction here, too. Oh, yeah. And I think this is my last picture. I just thought I'd show a picture of the interior. See the mirror again. Um, here's a squircle. Um, what else do I want to show? Oh, yeah, I, we can see a speaker right here. And if you zoom in at the top, this is the overhead lamp. It, it kind of, when I saw this, it kind of reminded me of the daytime running lamps on the front of the vehicle on the front. So, you know, Franz brought that all in. So it's like a cohesive environment. <laughs> it, it, just, it just looks good. Up on here, this would be your hazard button. And then if you have the issue where maybe the screen goes dead, there's also 
a park, reverse, neutral, and drive button that would light up right here so you can actually still drive the vehicle even though the display may not be working. And, and you see that can, interior, interior camera there. Yeah. Can what's the what's that device on the uh when on the um uh and yeah that device there. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a hammer. They were, I think they were going to try and use it to hit the side okay. of the vehicle. <laughs> They're just they playing around. They don't have a device for cleaning the windshield, huh? Because that's a huge reach into that windshield there. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's right. You, this is where the passenger airbag would be put. Way, yeah. You see this change in color right here? So the passenger airbag comes out around here. Yeah. You can also see the interior lighting. Randy, we can make a whole lot of money making some device, making some accessory to clean the damn windshield. Get all the way down there. I mean, I've yeah, 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 yeah. had that issue even on my own car. So it's, uh, do, do I say I the word? That. I have Can it I say the word now? Water bottle? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this was a fantastic tour, I must say, Ken. I, you know, this is the second time I've seen this tour, and it's it really gives you an insight into what goes into this car mm -hmm. if you hadn't been to the tour. And you're a car man then, Ken. You've been around them, you know, more than we have. I guess more than, I can't speak for Larry, but it sounds like you've, you know, been around cars all your life and around different companies that you actually work for. You're a Tesla man. Now, what would you say is the number one reason or, you know, a couple of reasons why you've just become so sold out on Tesla? Well, I knew... Um... Oh, I think back in 2014 or 2015, I I decided to go into the electric um, EV um, revolution. <laughs> I bought a, a BM. I released the BMW i3. And when that came out, I loved that car. It was quiet. It was fast. It was cavernous on the inside, just like this vehicle is going to be cavernous. the The quality of your life. Being in an electric vehicle is so much better than in an ice vehicle. So that really just bowled me over. Right. And, I, you know, being a software engineer and I've always liked technology. So these have so much technology. This vehicle is going to be a, it's a game changer. It has so much technology in it. And believe it or not, it makes the vehicle simpler for them to manufacture. Yeah, they've, they've talked so much about whether this will be something that a person would use on a construction site or on a, you know, on their farm or want to take off road, you know, is it really a, a trucker's truck? And, you know, at the, uh, it just, I, I'm, I'm not that guy, you know, I'm, I've never, I'm not sure I've ever driven a pickup truck in my entire life. Mm -hmm. um, but it would seem to me that if you can get all of the aspects of that truck in terms of what it can do technically you know for the job you're trying to get it to do and then it also goes zero to 60 in five seconds and drives like a rolls royce i i, I don't know what the problem is here <laughs> so, what would be the, sign me up <laughs> yeah I think we well, all have reservations, right? <laughs> yeah, I do. I'm, a, but I'm at like 167 thousand or something like that. So we got a way. We got a ways to go, right? So you know, I'm in Michigan, so I don't have a chance for the beginning. I'm not, I'm not even that. I'm like, I'm about where you are, Randy. 116, well, I think, thousand. But, but, well, the but, good thing about all of that is you guys will get it at a much lower price than I'll get it. <laughs> you know, well, I don't I don't think that I'm not sure Tony would probably my wife would probably be OK to spend, you know, one hundred and twenty thousand dollars on a car. But I'm not sure I could be persuaded. And yeah. the processes will be dialed in by then, too. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, not, I, I have to say, Larry, I did buy, you know, like a sixty five thousand dollar Jaguar 30 years ago. Really? So that's one hundred and twenty five thousand dollar car now. So, um, yeah, or more. Well, Ken, thank you so much for this. I really, you know, I think it was very valuable. I hope people enjoy it. I, I certainly did. I saw as much more the second time than the first time. So really thank great. You. And I did. And I, me. Yeah, I certainly appreciate it. I do want to remind people right now to I'll put up a card right here because Larry has been on so often. I want to make sure you see everything that Larry's on. He was on just earlier today. We were talking about the Federal Reserve uh, and about the Fed president and everything he said, all the details 
of what really did the Fed president say? So go back and take a look at that card is up right there. And, and I'll give you my contact information too. That'd be I, perfect. I put a lot of these pictures on uh, X. Okay, good, good. Yeah, we'd like, we'd like to have people be able to go and follow you on X. That'd be fantastic. All right, then. Anything else, gentlemen, before we conclude? That's it. I need to get my cyber truck. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, Ken. Thanks, Larry, for uh, bringing all of this information on. I am sure there's a bunch of the mechanical types out there that are going to really enjoy this detailed tour. And uh, to all of you out there, it's been great talking to you. Is somebody going to join Patreon? All right, I'm going to make a deal. Uh, this is going to be, uh, I've done this once before. It worked a little bit. Actually got a lot of people joining Patreon the last two weeks. But the last two days, not a single soul. So let's get you up on Patreon. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you one free audiobook. You can have two free if you want. Or you can have one free audiobook and the Cybertruck bottle opener. How's that? One and one. Okay. If you join at the $10 level, not at the $5 level, if you join at the $5 level, you just get to one book. Now, for if you're completely new to the channel, this is a bottle opener. It is a refrigerator magnet. It is three millimeter thick, stainless steel, really, really tough. Comes in a very cool magnetic box that makes it a great gift item. Um, so, you know, it's, it's got all kinds of people now buying them as gifts as a result of the fact that I have people, so many people that want to buy them as gifts and they're putting in these larger orders. I do have it all down. I think I put it all down below. I'll have to double check and make sure that it's up to date. Three, they're normally 25 bucks a piece. You get two for, <laughs> for $45. You get three for $60. Okay. You get a hundred for $200. $10 and you get $200 for $400, gets you all the way down to $20 a piece. If you are out of the country, I need you to add another uh, 20 bucks to that for freight, whichever one of those ones you pick. And then if you are, um, and then please let me know camo or regular. And of course, you can mix and match if you buy quantities, however you want to set that up. Um, so is there anything else I have left for you tonight? I think I've said it all. I have enjoyed speaking with you yet again. Click the link below to get your paperback, Kindle or audiobook now.